Hello and welcome to Just The Tonic, the podcast that shines the spotlight on the positive impact of the arts. I'm Katie Derham and welcome to episode four of our current series. If you missed previous episodes and series one, do catch up wherever you get your podcasts. We're in all the usual places. In the first series, we heard how listening to and creating music helps children learn numeracy and literacy and emotional skills. I chatted to Nicola Benedetti about the impact of her Benedetti Foundation, which has done so much to make music accessible to children of all backgrounds. And in this episode, we'll be hearing from the youngest member of the People's Orchestra, eight-year-old Aurora Chin Chan. I like all kinds of music. Now I am very happy to play in the People's Orchestra because I can play a lot of movie music here. We'll be hearing from some fabulous young poets taking part in Birmingham Children's Poetry Festival. I can use my legs to run. It is fun. I can use my legs to climb. I am proud my body is mine. And I'll be chatting to one of our best-loved poets, the wonderful Ian McMillan. Everybody can do this, and that's been my mission, to convince everybody that they can be writers and just say, have a go, have a go at this, have a go. I look forward to bringing you more from Ian later. It was such a great chat. As we've heard throughout both series of Just the Tonic, the People's Orchestra is a community of orchestras and choirs based in and around the West Midlands and increasingly further afield too. One of their newest members is eight-year-old, yes, only eight, Aurora Chin Chan from Hong Kong. And as she told our reporter Jamie Parker, she's already a multi-instrumentalist. I play cello, piano, flute, cornet and recorder. Aurora plays the cello with the People's Orchestra and at eight years old she is a student at the Birmingham Conservatoire. What do you like best about playing in the orchestra? I like the sound of all musical instruments playing together. It is bravos and sounds amazing. I like all kinds of music. Now I am very happy to play in the people of Ketra because I can play a lot of movie music here. Who are you inspired by in music? What, what, sort, of, what sort of musicians inspire you to play? I like my teachers at the conservatory. They are very good musicians. I also like Beethoven. He is a great musician and composer. I like his symphony number no. five. Would you like to have a career in music? Yes, I want to be a professional musician in future because I want to play in orchestra. I also want to be on YouTube or a TV show. That's Aurora playing an excerpt from Bach's Cello Suite No. 1. Many thanks to her, to Aurora's mum, Athena, and to Jamie. And I'm sure Aurora has a very bright future ahead of her. Now, let's hear from another very talented young person. I can use my legs to run. It is fun. I can use my legs to climb. I am proud my body is mine. That's Leo from Rattlebarn Primary School in Selly Oak performing the fantastic poem he wrote for the Birmingham Children's Poetry Festival. It's one of many events at Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games Festival for Young People and it's organised by Birmingham Cathedral. Here's their head of learning, Jane McArdle, to tell us more. We were really uh, wanting to make sure that we um, did something at the time of the Commonwealth Games and the Birmingham 2022 Festival in Birmingham to really um, celebrate what is great about the city, but to involve young people and schools from across 
the diocese and the city and the region as much as we could do. So we came up with the idea of a poetry festival um, and we wanted it to be something where all schools could take part regardless of their location. Um, And it was something that could be done in school and very much part of the curriculum and learning, which poetry is. So it was very embedded. So it wasn't an extra thing for teachers to take on, but something that was still relevant and meaningful to their daily curriculum. So poetry seemed like an obvious choice. Uh, And we wanted to be able to use our outdoor space, which is in a very central location in Birmingham, to display these poems that we were going to get back um, so that during the summer, when people are coming to Birmingham for the Commonwealth Games, they can see children's poetry inspired by sport and by the games as they're wandering around whatever time of day it might be. So um, we also wanted that to be an opportunity for families to come into the city as well. Because in a large city like Birmingham, we often find that families are very much invested in their local communities, but often don't come into the city centre at all. So this would offer them, offer them an incentive to come into the city and to come into the cathedral and see our wonderful spaces. Um, the festival, the, the poetry festival itself, is um, it's the first time we've done it, so it's really been a bit of a learning curve. Um, and we decided to base the themes for the festival on the themes of the Commonwealth Games, which are humanity destiny and equality and then following on from that linking again with the cultural festival we wanted to look at the power of the human body a sporting moment and a spirit of the game so this gave a kind of uh, a, a realm in which for the for, for teachers to be able to pitch the poetry for the children um, we also were very welcoming for any type of poem as well so they could be free verse it could be haiku it could be limerick We've actually ended up with a lot of acrostic poems, which seems to be a very popular choice as well. So we're very, very open to different types of creativity. We've actually been really overwhelmed with the response. I had no idea how many people would respond, but we've had a thousand entries to the festival, which is just wonderful. Here's Harley with his poem for the festival. I can run. It is a lot of fun. I am fast. I never come last. Great stuff, Harley. Thank you. And here's Kaya from Rattlebarn Primary School with another great poem. My race, my race. I'm so lucky to be in a race. I hope I will win. Oh, what a wonder it will be. All the crowds cheering. My race, my race. I hope I will win. I have to win, of course. I have to be strong. My race, my race. My race, my race. I'm starting now. Oh, will it really happen? I really hope I win. Finally, it's time. My coach says, you can do it. My race, my race. I run and run. I won! Thank you, Kaya. That was fab. Birmingham Poet Laureate Casey Bailey is supporting the Children's Poetry Festival and he has tonnes of experience encouraging young people to write poetry as he's also a head teacher. Any student that I talk to, I talk to about literature. I talk to them about whether they read and what they like to read. Uh, If they tell me that they don't like reading, uh, I would almost always say it's not that you don't like reading, it's that you haven't found something that you like reading yet. Um, And I talk to them about what I like to read, what I might suggest that they read. And I don't think I've ever worked at a school where I haven't had at least one or two students who um, I've had a little book exchange with, whether it's they give me a book and I give them a book that I really like, or even sometimes I just I just borrow them my books. Um, and those are my personal books that I really appreciate and really think, you know, this individual child will get something from it. Um, and I think on that level, you can really develop um, a passion for writing. I've also at um, I think, again, every school I've been at ran some form of writing club, um, which is outside of the curriculum, um, has no real relationship to the curriculum, if I'm, if I'm honest. It's not there to serve um, getting students to get better grades. It's there to serve them expressing themselves and feeling feeling comfortable and happy doing that. You know, poetry looks less daunting. So writing really good poetry or poetry that, that people think is really good um, can be very difficult. But looking at a poem and thinking, could I write something of that size, of that nature, 
feels more achievable. Now, even though when you get into it and you actually want to hone your craft, you realize, oh God, this is really hard. When you, if if I give you a novel and say write that, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, if you've never written anything like that, you're like, you can't write that. That's not a thing. Um, but when when someone says to you, oh, here you are, here's sixteen lines, here's fifteen lines, here's twenty two lines. Do you think you could write that? You think well, maybe, maybe I could say that much stuff. And then you start to work on actually honing it and developing it into a, a real skill and a real art form. Being his city's poet laureate is a real point of pride for Casey. I still remember when I first realised I wanted to be the Birmingham poet laureate. It was the same time I realised that Birmingham had a poet laureate. And I'd seen a poet called Roy McFarlane, who was just a stunning poet. Um, and they announced, they introduced Roy as a former Birmingham poet laureate. And I just watched him and, and saw how powerful he was as a performer, but also just his writing in and of itself uh, is stunning. And I thought, like, I want to be everything that this man is. So if he was a poet laureate, I want to be the poet laureate. I grew up in inner city Birmingham, um, a place that doesn't have a necessarily a great reputation, uh, isn't one of the places that you look to when you think about necessarily the great things that are happening in Birmingham. But it's full of great people. It's full of a great community. And I think to to hold um, kind of an official title in the city, coming from where I come from, is a beacon to people who come from where I come from to say, actually, you know, none of this is off limits to us. Um, and then beyond that, I think my, I said at the start of, of doing this, this role that I wanted to bring um, poetry to Birmingham and I wanted to bring Birmingham to poetry. So I want more people in Birmingham to see what poetry is and what it can do. Um, and I want more people outside of Birmingham to realize that this poetry scene that we have here is very special. Um, and I'm just privileged to be a part of it and to be, be an ambassador for it at this moment in time. I'm sure the Birmingham Children's Poetry Festival will be an inspiration for many young and not so young people. Here's Freddie from Rattlebarn Primary with his poem for the festival. Every four years we dive into all those sports. We push through the water, we flip, we bend. You are a star when you swing the racket as hard as you can. We play lots of sports, we win prizes, get back up, no one loses. We all win for trying, we dive right into teamwork and happiness. Another excellent one. Freddie, thank you very much. And thanks also to Jane and Casey and to Leo and Harley and Kaya for their brilliant poems. You can find out more about the festival at birmingham2022.com. Now from some up-and-coming young poets to one of the best-loved poets in the land, the wonderful Ian McMillan. He's poet in residence at Barnsley Football Club. He's been resident poet at the English National Opera, where he wrote the libretto for the world's first opera in a South Yorkshire dialect. And he presents Radio 3's poetry programme, The Verb. I could listen to him all day. Former poet laureate Carol Ann Duffy called Ian world class, one of today's great poetry performers. And according to the Times Educational Supplement, he is the Shirley Bassey of performance poetry which I will have to remind him of next time I see him. His latest book, My Sand Life, My Pebble Life, recalls childhood days at the seaside. And I began by asking him if his interest in poetry started at a young age. It began for me at junior school because, being the age I am, I went to a junior school in the West Riding of Yorkshire. And the West Riding of Yorkshire was run by a godlike genius, the education officer called Sir Alec Clegg who is forgotten these days. But at that time, he said, all children are creative. And he wrote this wonderful book called The Excitement of Writing that included work by established poets, but also work by children from schools. And he said, all you've got to do is make things all day in school. So we sang, we danced, we wrote, we painted, we made sculptures. At the end of the maths lesson, we'd write a poem. At the end of history, we'd sing a song. So it became just the thing to do. You felt, all right, I am a creative human being. That's what I am. And I kind of gravitated towards words, partly because uh, my dad liked to tell a tale. My dad was a storyteller, if you like. Him and my mother met as pen pals in the Second World War. My dad was from Scotland. My mother was from Barnsley. And they had this... He was in the Navy, she was in the WAFs. And they had this scheme where single service people could write to each other. And so they wrote to each other. My dad wrote these most romantic letters, uh, making quite a lot of the things he was telling her up. 
And so if it comes through your DNA, then that's where it comes. You think, yes, writing is, writing is important. I'm here because they met through writing. And then at my school, we were said, yeah, you can be a writer. They would say that in as many words. You can be a writer. And my teacher, Mrs Roach, I remember writing a thing. This is when I was about seven, that when the giant came out of the mouse hole, and a lesser teacher than Mrs Roach would have said, Ian, don't be silly, giants can't come out of mouse holes. And she went, that's great, she gave me a star. And I thought, well, that, and then I thought, everybody can do this. And that's been my mission ever since, to convince everybody that they can be writers, that they can be artists of whatever sort, but my speciality is writing. And just say, have a go, have a go at this, have a go. You know, nobody's going to tell you off, but if they do, don't listen to them. Your writing is as valid as anybody else's. I've just been doing a series of workshops in Doncaster with people with mental health issues, and we just sit together, we have a laugh, I have a flip chart, we make a group poem up together on the flip chart. My mate will turn up with his piano accordion, we'll turn it into a song, and at the end of it, they feel fantastic. And not only that, they feel like they are creative people. So for me, it's a kind of a lifelong mission. And I've decided that once, once I've met everybody in the world and I've got everybody in the world to write a poem, I'll, I'll have a day off. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> it's not going badly. No, to it's not fair. too badly, but it's not my yeah. plan to visit, to do a gig in every village hall in Britain, which I've now kind of given up on, but I had this plan to do a gig in every village hall in Britain because there are 36,264, I think, and I've been to about... 500, but there are still a lot. And it's the same thing. It's this idea, wherever you visit, wherever you go, that can be a, a nexus for art. That can be a place where art can happen. Probably like you, whenever I visit a building, whenever I go past an empty shop, whenever I go past a church, I think, gosh, what concerts can we put on there? Mm. What workshops can we put on? What exhibitions can we put on? Until, in the end... There is no difference between the kind of the high art cathedrals that we all love and the low art lean tos that we can also love. I've just Do invented that phrase, the low art lean to, Katie, and I'm going to keep it. <laughs> I think it's good. I think, I think I'm going to jot it down. Yeah. <laughs> Make a little note. I think that um, the work that you do is unbelievably admirable. And it's interesting to hear that you have come from that environment. Um, where it was considered normal. When you're now doing workshops with young people, how easy is it for them to kind of unleash that creativity, which is in all of us? I mean, do you find that kids are, are, are open to it? Kids really are open to it, partly because at school these days, as we know, it's not much like the West Riding. You know, there isn't that sense of unfettered creativity. There's a lot of fronted adverbials to be done. There's a lot of you've got to do this to, for the exam. There's a lot of that. Oh and God, that yeah. kind of does stamp a bit on creativity. So when I visit schools, I am like, hopefully, a breath of fresh air saying, let's just have a go at this. Let's make this up. And honestly, they love it. Particularly, I do my, my favourite age groups to work with are infants. Infants are fantastic because infants have such joyous creativity and as long as you go along with it that's fine and also I quite like I like juniors and I like year sixes because year six is when you, it very rarely happens in your life that you're at the top of a tree and the world is full of possibilities and when you're a year six your body's changing your mind is changing you're at the top of the tree you're about to go to the big school and they've got such fantastic, fantastic ideas. So I, I just walk in and when I, when I go to schools, I always try and make their space magic because that's what my teachers did for me. They made my space a magical space. So I walk into a classroom that they're used to, that they've been in, and I'll, I'll, see, a, I'll see a watering can. I'll say, oh, yeah, I see that's that watering can that was lost in 1824 by so-and-so. Let's tell some stories about this watering can. And then, you know, the, the space that they're in becomes magical and we start making things about the watering can. I'm a big one for getting people going in and coming out. I'll get, I'll get a child to go out of the room and come in with some news and then we'll make up this thing. And to get away from the ones, because you know when you visit a school, they'll be the ones who are good at writing. This is great and we love them. We love them very much. But they'll be the ones that will be putting their hand up and I'd rather work with the ones that aren't that bothered, you know, I don't want to. And so that's why I do a group thing to start with. I can pick out the ones and get them doing it and then we'll do something individual. I remember working at a pupil referral unit years ago with 
kids who, for whatever reason, sometimes they didn't like school, sometimes school didn't like them, all that kind of thing, they've been excluded from school. And I, <laughs> I wish I'd filmed this terrible error that I made. Because <laughs> I went in and I said, uh, right, there was me and a musician and a dancer. I said, right, we're going to make up a rap, <laughs> says the middle-aged man. <laughs> we're going to make up a rap about our names. And they all sat in these rows and they all had hoods, hoodies on. Mm. And I said, so we're going to make a rap about... It was on Beckett Road in Doncaster, this pupil referral unit. I said, right, and it's going to go, I was walking down Beckett Road someday and I saw some people coming my way and I saw... And, I was, and they were going to give their name. And as one... They kind of lifted the hoods up and put the hoods <laughs> over the faces and shrank like turtles into a shell. And I met a lad recently who beat. He said, "I remember that. I remember that because and that was me getting it wrong. You know, I'm thinking, oh, they, and with that kind of age group, you have to sort of take your time with them. I'm not as good mm. with teenagers. Some people are fantastic with teenagers. I like the juniors because they're kind of as enthusiastic and as daft as me, and just." You can you can do ridiculous things with them, whereas teenagers... But then again, when, when you can unleash what teenagers do, teenagers write about themselves, teenagers write about the world, we know how concerned teenagers are with the state of the world. You know, they can, they can write about that. But I realised that my approach then was kind of a bit uh, off-beam. <laughs> but, you know, you never feel anything as deeply as you do when you're 15, do you? No, oh you don't, goodness, you don't. never again. And, you know, I look back at some of the poems I wrote when I was 15... When I thought that simply by the act of writing this poem, even if nobody reads it, would actually change the world for the better. And yes, we do want teenagers to feel that. And that's why I want them to feel valued, you know, and say, look, your your work is as valuable as anybody else's. And that's the that's the thrust of what we're about, surely. Just saying, look, your work is valuable. My secondary school teacher, Mr. Brown, who I still think about, he did things like he'll get you to write a poem and then he'll type it out. And put it in a little book. And so, look, here's your poems in a book. And you think, goodness gracious me, there's my poems in a book. He validated the poems by putting them in a book. Mind you, um, I was I was so daft that I thought S-A was spelled S full stop, A full stop, and it stood for S-A. And I remember writing my S-A by Ian McMillan, future Nobel Prize for literature winner, and Mr Brown <laughs> taking me on one side and going, Ian... Nobel Prize winners don't come from Barnsley. And that's the thing I disagree with him about, actually, because I think, as we know, they can come from anywhere, you know. And this idea of the, the sacred place where art can be made, it can be made absolutely anywhere. So I think art can be made anywhere. But uh, I think I always had quite a bit of confidence and it was mainly thanks to these teachers. Because mm -hmm. a lot of teachers, we can all do it, people like us who've, who've done well, can point to particular teachers who just said, you can do this. And that's why I, that's why I always do it. What was the leap then for you? Because obviously your teachers were telling you, but also all your classmates as well, that you can be a writer, mm. you can be a singer, you can be a dancer, you can make and create. Yeah. But presumably not everybody in your class went on to be an artist, a writer no. or a dancer. So what made you keep going well, I with think it? I, as you can tell, I've always been a show-off. So I like the idea of showing off. And showing off was a thing. And, and I like showing off. So... I would write poems, and then I think, where can I perform these poems? So I'd go to the local folk club. Me and my mate would go to the folk club, and there'd be singers' nights where somebody would sing a shanty, and then somebody would sing a Bob Dylan song, and somebody would sing their own song. Then somebody would get up, like me or somebody else, and read a poem. And then you think, well, wait a minute, I could read poems, I could stand up and read poems. And the first time you do it, you're terrible. You know, you're always in like this because you're so <laughs> nervous, and then as you stand up, you go, I've written all this tripe, but then... People respond to it and you think, ah, that's interesting. Could this be a job? Could this reading out of poems be a job? Then I went to see the Liverpool poets, Adrian Henry, Brian Patton and Roger McGough, in a pub in Doncaster. And they read it and I thought, that's, that's their job. Meanwhile, I've just got married. And so you can't actually... And they were getting no money. So you think, well, I'm going to have to get a job before I can do it as a job. So I went to work in various manual jobs. And then, wonderfully, just the way that a little bit of money helps. We all know a little bit of money helps. So in 1983, uh, Yorkshire Arts Association, who were like the branch of the Arts Council, were giving out these grants. And they give you up to £1,000 if you gave your job up and went freelance. And £1,000 in 1983, it's a lot of money now. 
But it was a lot of money in 1983. And you go, I can give me a job and be a freelance writer performer. Yes, I'll do it. And I've always been encouraged. So my wife said, yeah, go on. And my parents went, go on then. So I applied for this thousand quid and they gave me 800 quid, which is a lesser amount, not by much, <laughs> but psychologically, so much less. A thousand pounds, I'm like, a thousand pounds, 800 pounds. But luckily, my wife and parents went, go on then, give you a job. Go on then, you want to do it? Do it, do it. So I did it. And then that thing happens to everybody who's gone freelance where you go, right, I'm here. Come on, come on, world. Form a queue. <laughs> Nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. Your 800 quid starts to dwindle. So then I did what we've all done as freelancers. When somebody rings you up, we go, yes, 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 and do that. So I started doing writing workshops all over South Yorkshire for the WEA, the Workers' Educational Association. I was writing little reviews for the New Musical Express of bands. I'd go and see a band somewhere, I'd write the review, I'd go on the bus to Barnsley Station, I'd been typed the review out, I would then have to send the review by Red Star Parcel, remember that, to St Pancras where it got picked up. They would pay me £9.23 or something for the review, it cost me £10 to send it, but <laughs> it got my name there. And then somebody said, do you fancy coming into a school and doing poems? I went, yeah, all right, yeah. And it was, I was terrible. But after a bit you realise you can do it. And so, and it was that, and it was thinking, all right, I can actually make a living from, from talking about it as much as writing it. Mm. You know, the writing especially for the first few years, was just a thing I did. But the, make, the talking about it, the encouraging, the workshops. So then, yeah, that was 1983. And since then, I've, I've not had a day off. So, <laughs> and, you know, you say well, yes. It's all those village halls, you it say. It is the village halls. And, just, and, and it, the saying yes leads to adventures. And after a bit, you realise if it doesn't work, they won't ask you again. I always think in geological time. I said to people, look, if, if something goes badly in 200,000 years, who cares? Now, the moment it's going badly, it's the worst thing that ever happened. You know, as it's going badly, you think, mm-hmm. why am I doing this? This mm-hmm. is awful. But then, even six weeks later, nobody remembers. A year later, nobody remembers. So I think, you know, don't don't worry. That's why I always say to people as well, if you want to go freelance, times have always been hard, so don't worry. Always say yes, at least to our ventures. And it's, a, it's an exciting world out there. It really is. What is it, do you think, about poetry that distills emotion and is, is, makes it so powerful, as opposed to you writing a, a wonderful short story or mm. writing the great uh, Yorkshire novel? I think the thing about poetry is that it, it, its basis is in three things, rhythm, song and white space. So to me, the rhythm of the poem is based around just this rhythm that we're living through now where the sun comes up and the sun goes down and your heart beat and you walk up the stairs and the rhythm of that, you walk down the stairs, you walk down the street. We're surrounded by rhythm and what poetry can do in language is replicate that rhythm. Poetry is also very close to song. And, you know, people have said that song began with people shouting to accompany music, that that's how it began, that somehow... That's what we are. We are people who want to make a noise with our mouths. And poetry is about that. And poetry is about trying to express emotion, tell people what you've just seen. And then to me, the other actual real essence of poetry is the white space at the edge of the page. Because a story nudges the edge of the page. A poem ends halfway across a page, giving you such a licence to do what you want with the end of that line, because there's all that white space around it, like a field, like a field that you can play in. So because of that, you can you can write a line that's tiny. I mean, one of my favourite poems is that one of William Carlos Williams' uh, The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Oh, my goodness, what a great poem that is. And, and I'll take that to writing workshops and people, people turn the page expecting more. And, you know, that's it. That's the lot. That wouldn't work as a short story. It'd be terrible as a film. <laughs> but to see those words, just and he, he, he divides it up so you've got lots of white space. And to me, that's what poetry can do. It can, as you said, distill language. It can turn language into jewels. But it can also be about the things that we experience every day so that... William Carlos Williams, living in Patterson, would have seen this wheelbarrow. And so the wheelbarrow becomes an emblem for all kinds of things. That's what I think is the difference, in a way, that it it is just language at its purest, because it's got the heartbeat, it's got the echo of song, and it's got the space around it. Now, I've got to ask you, Ian, about the boy Noah. 
because I love the boy Manoa is my favourite person on Twitter. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> well, I mean, the boy Noah, he is. I've got two. I've got three grandchildren. I've got uh, Thomas. We now call him Young Man Thomas. He's now driving. <laughs> oh, good lord! Unbelievably, despite the fact that he made, he's still seven. <laughs> We've got Young Isla, who is very, very artistic, really beautifully artistic. She she sent me a Father's Day card because I'm a granddad, but she wrote it back to front because she will be a poet or something. Mm. And the boy Noah is just. <clears throat> He's the most energetic and loving young man. He's five. And for a year, we, we had him every Tuesday. So Tuesdays, he would arrive at half past seven and he'd run in the house. Come on, Grandad, let's go. And me, the 66-year-old man, had to run as fast as him up and down. And, but, and he would say, right, Grandad, we're going to make a story now. So uh, you'll be the Hulk, I'll be Spider-Man, and we'll do this and you do that. And then... And then he said, you make up the best stories, Grandad. So we had to make up stories. So all day, it was like one of those kind of... Like they have in Morocco, you know, the story, the storytelling place in the middle of Morocco, the storytelling mm. square. Uh, it's called El Fna. It was like that all day. <laughs> and then he said, right, Grandad, come on, push me on the swing. At the same time, tell a story. And then he'd say, we'd be playing at something. And he'd go, we, we shouldn't play at Grandad. Make it into a story. So I have to go, Grandad and Noah were sitting in the house. So yes, the boy Noah, he is he's an absolute whirlwind. And it's any... And uh, you know you've seen him on Twitter. He, he keeps me, he keeps me young, and also he keeps me, he keeps reminding me that I've got to keep making stuff up and keep telling stories and keep doing that. Yes, it's uh, it's a great thing being a granddad. Absolutely, you, you make it sound um, you make it sound like sort of poetry as extreme sport. It, well, that's what it is. It is, <laughs> it is poetry. Is, that's exactly what it is. Poetry is extreme sport, <laughs> which of course it was in the early days of the Olympics. They would run the run the marathon, then they'd do a poem. So it's always been. Poetry has yeah. always been an extreme sport. <laughs> <laughs> we should bring that back. We should we bring should. it back. We should. Well, I suppose the, we have the cultural Olympiads, don't they? But I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd like to see it yeah. properly combined once again. No, that would be, be grand. Good. Huge thanks to Ian, Casey Bailey, Jane McArdle, Leo, Harley, Kaya and Freddie from Rattlebarn Primary School, and to Jamie, Athena and Aurora from the People's Orchestra. In the next episode, we'll be hearing from some young people who've been dipping their toes into the wonderful world of opera. And I'll be chatting to the marvellous operatic tenor and all-round force of nature, Nikki Spence. If we've inspired you to pick up a pen to write poetry or to pick up an instrument to make music, search online for writing and music groups in your area or get in touch with Arts Council England, the Arts Council of Wales, the Arts Council of Northern Ireland or Creative Scotland. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on social media for updates. We're on Twitter and Instagram. And if there's someone that you think we should include in the podcast, let us know. Thanks for listening. Just the Tonic with Katie Derham was produced by Jill Davis and is a Peanut and Crumb production supported by the People's Orchestra and Arts Council England. Music